All right, good morning. Happy Monday. I hope you're all doing well and had a great weekend. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at chapter nine. Now, this material is the beginning of the next section of Chem 222. So while we just got through Lewis structures and, and uh, hybridization and organic chemistry and all that kind of stuff, now we're going to start looking more at the states of matter. So this section's on gases, uh, the next section's on liquids and solids, and then we'll also look at solutions. Um, this material, I'm just letting you know, will be relevant after the midterm, all right? But I need to kind of get ahead of the lectures a little bit here, so that's why we're starting it. So let's talk about the other things that are happening this week. Um, Wednesday, when you come to class, please bring me your completed organic chemistry lab, and also exam prep one will be due. Now, some of you have seen exam prep before, but not everybody. Um, before the midterms, I like to give out a single page, double-sided kind of handout where there's a question and the answer is given and you just show your work how you go from the question to the answer. So you know what the answer is going to be and you know what the question is. I'm hoping that it's pretty chill to figure out how these problems work. On the other hand, you look at problem number four on exam prep and you're like, what the, <laughs> all right? Uh, no, don't be afraid to contact me and stuff and ask me questions, because I want everybody to be on the level playing field before the midterm, so. That'll be due uh, Wednesday. Probably Wednesday, what I'll do too during this, the recitation part, is I'll just have questions. If anybody wants to ask questions, I'll try to do examples. Um, I'll have some examples of problems and stuff to do, to give you experience. Any questions, that kind of stuff? Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, I am changing a couple of the labs this term to online labs due to COVID and everything else that's just so messy. And one of them, reluctantly, is this week. This was one of my favorite labs, but there's just a lot of chaos right now, I'll be honest. So anyway, this week's lab, Molar Mass of Volatile Liquid, I do want you to do the online version, not the in-class version. Um, what we'll do is Wednesday, after we talk about exam preps and stuff like that, I'll give a quick lecture on what this material is going to be like. So it shouldn't be like hardcore for you. You can also, of course, watch the video that the Section W1 students do and stuff to do it. Um, you can turn this in either on paper the following week, or you can just email it to me. It's fine, too. Either way is okay. Sorry about that, but that's kind of the way that works. Uh, questions on that? Okay, and then last thing, <clears throat> Wednesday night after my, lab, my later lab, I will release midterm exam one. And midterms, like the quizzes, are things that you'll download, fill out, and then send back to me. Now normally, midterms are, due, are, are released Wednesday, and they're usually due Fridays at nine, like the quizzes. Um, I've got something weird going on with my family, so it's gonna be very difficult to get in touch with me uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I'm going off to the place where there's supposedly no internet. Now I'm hoping there is, but I don't know for sure. So because I want people to be able to get a hold of me if they need it, I'm extending the deadline on this midterm to Sunday by 11.59 p.m. So it gives you lots of time. <coughs> uh, Wednesday, or Thursday night, you have a problem, and you email me, just be realized it'll take me a little bit longer to get back to you because of something else I've got going on. Um, so that'll be due Sunday by midnight. Um, I should return them to you by the following Thursday, if all goes well. So again, sorry about the delay here. This is a personal thing, but uh, hey man, it's an exciting time. Any questions, anything? Okay, really glad to have you here. So um, in this section, we're gonna get away from valence bonds and Lewis structures, hybridization, sigma bonds, pi bonds, and we're gonna start talking more about gases. And you know what's interesting about gases to me is that if I said, uh, you know, uh, hey Caden, I've got some gas in my hand, all right, and I wanna show it to him and I open my hand, boom, the gas goes away, right? And so controlling a gas is pretty difficult. But actually, a lot of early chemistry started with the study of gases, which is just fantastic, because they are hard to control. You have to contain them, and you know, you've got a leak, and psh, there goes your sample, right? But actually, a lot of chemistry started here, which is pretty cool. So anyway, so let's see all what's happening here with gases. Um, 
one of the things that's very relevant for gas besides breathing, of course, um, is airbags. And uh, my sister was in a really bad wreck a while ago, and the airbag she feels really saved her from serious injury. I mean, she was bruised and stuff, but it was uh, not too bad. When an airbag deflate, inflates in your car, it's a nitrogen-based gas almost all the time. So there's different ones apparently, but that's the main one. Sodium azide is this funky little thing, and it doesn't take long for it to break down into quite a bit of nitrogen gas, which expands, so then when you rock into it, it kind of bounces you back. In a collision involving a car equipped with airbags, the impact initiates a chemical reaction. Automobile airbags work when a sample of sodium azide detonates, producing nitrogen gas. This gas fills the bag. Using our understanding of the gas laws, we can calculate the quantity of sodium azide required to produce the appropriate amount of nitrogen gas. So like I said, studying gases is really what started chemistry, but now um, it's actually very relevant, saves lives and stuff like that. So we're going to be able to describe the behavior of gases, what this amount means in terms of a gas and stuff. So uh, check it out. According to the kinetic molecular theory, the molecules of a solid are locked in place, though they have motion. Molecules of a liquid are closely associated with each other, but move relative to one another. Molecules of a gas move independently and occupy a much larger volume than those of a corresponding liquid or solid. In Chem 221, we talked about the kinetic molecular theory of gases, KMT, and we talked about how the difference between a solid, liquid, and gas is really a measure of relativity, like how close they are and what they do. Um, these are stupid examples of the sheet because I'm immature, let's be honest, but anyway, uh, I want to talk about it. Now, if you don't like this sheet, and I, that's a little weird, um, this is a picture from the Olympics uh, up by Olympia, and I like this because it's about as good of a way to capture on a photograph all three phases. Uh, if you look up in the mountains there in the Olympics, uh, those are that snow, all right, which is basically solid water. Of course, the sailboat here is on liquid water. And blowing the sailboat, although that's a lot of other gases, there is some water vapor inside them. So this is kind of a fun picture that kind of shows all three phases, maybe not gas as well. But the important thing I want to point out right now is that all three phases of water are water, all right? They're all H2O, they're all tetrahedral, SP3, bent, 109 angles, blah, blah, blah. It's the difference between the water molecules that makes a solid into a liquid and a liquid into a gas. So for example, in a solid, according to the kinetic molecular theory, the water molecules are just really close to each other, all right? And there's a lot of interaction between the different molecules as they move around. In a liquid, all right, there is an interaction between them, but it's looser, all right? Like you can see here how the molecules are a little further apart. The interactions here must be stronger. And in a gas, there's literally no interactions at all. They're like all over the place. So with the stupid sheep idea here, all right, here's the sheep really tight in a pen or something like that. That would be like a solid. Liquids here, you can see the sheep are kind of moving through this hole in the wall intentionally or unintentionally, I'm not sure. Um, liquids do tend to move kind of together, but they flow like a liquid does. And that's what these sheep I thought was kind of funny do. And then when it comes to the gas, the molecules are just all over the place. But the first thing and the most important thing of these next several chapters is that you realize that water is water. It's H2O. And it doesn't matter if you have a piece of ice or a glass of water or you're breathing in steam from a humidifier or something like that. All of it's H2O. It's the relative interactions between them that defines what a solid, liquid, or a gas is. Any questions on Now, gases are what we're going to focus on a lot in this chapter. We're going to talk more about liquids and solids and then even solutions in future chapters. So let's talk about what makes a gas a gas, all right? And the first thing you probably realize is that in a gas, there's a lot of free space. Um, I'm talking to all of you through a gas, all right? The air we breathe and there's nitrogen and a little water and stuff, but you can see me, all right? If there was a lot of stuff between you 
with me, you couldn't see me. So gases are essentially a lot of empty space. You can expand the gas a lot. So if you have like my hand of gas and I open it up, the gas then goes to fill up the space of the, of the area. And if we open the doors out there, that gas would even expand further into the outside. So you can expand them as much as you want. You can also condense the gases down if you have the right equipment usually. Um, if you have a container, it's the gas totally fills up the container evenly. So imagine here with this uh, disinfectant bottle, uh, if I had a gas in this area, there wasn't any liquid, it would be just as much gas up here as there is down here. Now, gravity does play a little bit of a factor, so there might be a tiny bit more down here than up here due to gravity, but overall, gases usually have enough energy to overcome gravity, so it's no problem. And of course, this is different than the liquid that's in there. You can see how the liquid is just on the bottom part of the container. And of course, solids would be the same way. They would also be on the bottom. So gases are kind of unique. They take up the whole space of the area. They don't just settle at the bottom. <clears throat> this is also something interesting. If you put two gases together, they mix really well. Diffusion, we're going to see, is basically the mixing of gases. And that's kind of interesting. That doesn't always happen with liquids, and it certainly doesn't happen with solids. So as a, an example, um, <clears throat> if you had uh, oil and water, all right, they don't mix very well together. But any, almost any two gases you put together, uh, they're going to they're gonna come together pretty easily. <laughs> Gas and release balloons, so if any of them pops, they may die. Oh, April, we would all die. Gases fill the volume of whatever container they're in. School. <laughs> okay, so this is from The Office, I think, or one of these kind of shows. I love that little part. I don't know anything about this show. Of course, that's a uh, uh, guy from um, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. But anyway, uh, he's right. <clears throat> In theory, all right, if you have just one balloon of gas and that would pop, then the gas would expand in that whole area. And if it really was poisonous and stuff, it would kill people. Kind of dark for a Monday. Sorry, but hopefully you get the cheesy humor. In here. Anyway, questions? Good. <laughs> anyway, when you have uh, gases, all right, math modeling actually works really, really well for things. And so if you want to describe a gas and control it so the balloon doesn't break or something like that, uh, you can do it pretty easily with math. And this isn't like super crazy math, like calculus or anything. Um, the model for uh, gas, like any other substance, has to describe all the variables involved in controlling it. And so for gases, you need to figure out the volume of the gas. And the volume in this next section is going to be almost always a capital V. <coughs> and also, liters is the most common and we'll see the really useful unit when it comes to the volume of gas. But in addition to the volume of gas, you have to know the temperature. Because just like you and me, if it's warmer, you're maybe more active, colder, it's a little harder to get started. Well, gases definitely figure out that way too. So T stands for the temperature. And we're gonna see that the Kelvin temperature is super, super useful when it comes to gases and figuring out what they're up to. <clears throat> now, you also have to know how much of the gas there is. A little bit or a lot makes a big difference sometimes in reactivity and stuff. Now, more amount, which is usually given this symbol N, is usually going to be in moles. So we're back here to doing gram to mole kind of thing, which we'll talk about all of this here in a second. And the fourth thing that gases really need to have a great understanding is what's called the pressure of the gas. Now, pressure is a new player when it comes to chemistry. We haven't talked about this yet. Pressure, which we'll see a little bit, is usually, for chemistry anyway, usually recorded in atmospheres. So ATM stands for atmospheres, not where you get your money out from the bank machine. Um, <clears throat> atmospheres of pressure is super helpful for chemistry, like we'll see. So if you know the volume of the gas you're dealing with, the temperature of the gas, the amount in moles and the pressure in atmospheres, there's a lot of things you can do with gases when it comes to controlling them. Okay, so 
What is pressure? Great question. Italians in the 1600s were fascinated by this phenomenon, which is fantastic. And Torricelli, <clears throat> all right, in 1643, developed a way to measure the pressure. And pressure is essentially all the gas molecules pushing down on us all the time, all right? That's the stupidest, but zero quality, you know, that really is what it is. It's all the molecules of gas pushing down. Um, if you watch science fiction movies, they're in space, and there's an airlock breach, and people, ah, you know, they blow up or whatever. That's because there's no pressure in space, all right? It's basically empty. So we're used to, as our bodies, like all this pressure pushing down. And so in space, when this pressure isn't pushing, well, something's pushing back, we're going to see. So that's why bodies blow up and stuff like that. <clears throat> Not really relevant for what we're talking about, but still, if you're curious. Anyway, back to Torricelli. 1643 in Italy, he developed this thing. He used mercury, and we'll see why here in a little bit. Mercury, liquid mercury, is a great liquid for measuring how what the barometer is. And there, this is a pool of mercury. There's a vacuum inside this tube. And the pressure is constantly pushing down on us and the mercury. So as it pushes, then the mercury rises. Now after a while, because mercury is so dense, the gravity starts to push back. It wants to go back to the ground, essentially. So this kind of equilibrium can be measured. And it can be measured just with like a ruler. And in millimeters of mercury, uh, 760 is a word we're going to use quite a bit. Now, your little column right there has to be calibrated for different things. The width of the mercury, the height of the thing, the depth, the blah, blah, blah. However, just realize it's possible. Um, in the break, over here to my left, it's not visible probably even to Ben, but there is a barometer actually right here. <laughs> and it's just a mercury column. And there's a little thing you adjust up and down that can actually measure what the pressure of a system is. Um, if you watch weather reports here from the weather channels, they will list pressure sometimes. Uh, they'll use different types of units, but they'll say like pressure barometers falling, barometers rising. That's what they're measuring is pressure. Pressure is usually indicative of storm systems coming in, leaving, whatever, so. Cool. Okay. I had like a so-so date with Valerie. Now I'm number nine on the speed dial. So? So, I used to be seven. I dropped two spots. What, she's ranking you? Yeah, the speed dial is like a relationship barometer. What is a barometer exactly? It's pronounced thermometer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that really cracks me up. The Seinfeld, the, uh, sorry, the bad references just keep coming. Um, in that problem, they're saying, no, pronounced thermometer. No, thermometer, of course, is for temperatures, all right? That's what therm thermometers are for. Barometer is for measuring the pressures on different things. So anyway, if you see Seinfeld value. All right, questions on any of this? Probably good. All right, <clears throat> now, uh, scientists developed uh, a system to measure pressure. And you know, like the ruler stick didn't just happen overnight. People talked about it as societies, and they came up with the idea of this is one meter, okay? Well, an equivalent kind of conversation, conversations happened with pressure. And they came up with the idea of what's called a standard ATM, a standard atmosphere, all right? And so a standard atmosphere is kind of like a meter stick. It's a way to measure pressure and compare it to other places. The theory is, is that one atmosphere is the pressure when you're at the ocean, all right? So if you went over to Seaside, for example, Seaside, Oregon, which is on the coast, you should have a pressure that's close to an atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> so a standard atmosphere can be related to other kinds of units. So remember that this ma uh, mercury here is going up and down the column. If the length of the mercury column <clears throat> is 760 millimeters, or 76 centimeters, that's another way of describing an atmosphere. So if you go to Seaside and your mercury column is 760 millimeters or 76 centimeters, because there's 10 millimeters per centimeter, that would also be equal to one atmosphere. So this is like a way to measure to see if you're at the atmosphere. Now, <clears throat> a tor is named after Torricelli, the person that started the, made the first barometer. A tor and a millimeter of mercury are the same thing. 
So if you see a, a recording of 760 tor, then now you know that that's also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. There's another unit though, which is pretty helpful for scientists, and it's called the millibar or the bar. So back to the metric system, there are a thousand millimeters in a meter. Well, a millibar is related in a likewise way to a bar. A bar is 1.013 bars is an atmosphere. And if you take this number and multiply by a thousand, you get 1,013 millibars. So they say that chemists can't pass up a bar, and of course, just say no kids, but however, it's kind of a funny joke. This is another way that you can relate uh, pressures to back to an atmosphere. Now, <clears throat> on the US Weather Channel, when they talk about the pressure, it's usually in inches of mercury. So they say, oh, barometer is falling to 28 you know, inches or something like that. That's what they're referring to. It's a type of a measurement. So if you had uh, a mercury column like this, you could actually measure then 29.9 inches, for example. 29.9 inches equals an atmosphere. And we're not usually going to use inches of mercury because I dislike all the imperial units, but if you do see it or on weather, it's cool. Now, mercury is super toxic with a thing like this. It can absolutely spill. You might be thinking, why are people using mercury? Well, another, of course, common liquid is water. And if you made a mercury column with water and you wanted to measure it, it would be 34 feet high, all right? And that's pretty high. <laughs> um, at Dartmouth, they had one of these. It was in this big kind of alcove, like three or four levels high. And they had this really long water thing that they could actually measure. Um, if you have the vertical space for a 30 foot long tube, this is a better way because you get small fluctuations more, uh, stuff like that. However, in most areas like this room right here, we could put up something 34 feet, but we could absolutely have a mercury column. So it's mostly just a difference. The density of mercury is a lot higher than the density of water. So it takes a lot less vertical distance for an atmosphere than it would for water, stuff like that. And finally, if you take physics, they like the Pascal, P-A, all right? The Pascal is the true SI unit for uh, pressure. So just like joules is the official unit for energy, Pascals are the official unit for pressure. And a 101.325 kilopascals is an atmosphere, blah, blah, blah. Now, chemists don't usually use the Pascal, though, because we're so obsessed with the atmosphere. So we're more likely to use millimeters of mercury, tor, and millibar, i.e. <coughs> not coughing because I have a cold trying to give you a hint, you should know that one atmosphere equals this many millimeters of mercury, this many millibars, all right? You don't have to worry about inches of mercury, the Pascal, I don't worry about water, but if you do know the millimeters of mercury, tor, and the bar millibar, good to go. Any questions on any of this? Now, all of this stuff here, I'm talking about metrics, talking about conversions, means that we're back in the world of math, all right? Uh, in the last three chapters, we haven't talked about math very much. We've been more focusing on geometry and building molecules and the names of the organics. In this chapter, we definitely are reintroduced to math. And math, of course, means significant figures again. Um, we'll talk about things, how to go from Celsius to Kelvin, all that kind of jazz. If you ever have questions on any of that kind of stuff from Chem 221, definitely reach out. Uh, we haven't used it for a while, and I know that most people don't use it in their day-to-day -day world. Questions on that? All right. So here's a type of a question you might run into, all right? This nitrogen gas sample has a pressure of 452 millimeters of mercury. And we want to convert this into atmospheres, and then what do you do, all right? Well, what we'll do is we'll use this conversion right here, which just says 760 millimeters of mercury equals one atmosphere of pressure. And by the way, this 760 is considered an exact amount, so it doesn't affect your sig figs. 
So in this problem, we're going to convert millimeters of mercury into atmosphere. We're going to take the 452 millimeters of mercury. Let me write it out. 452 millimeters of mercury. And this conversion says that 760 millimeters of mercury are in one atmosphere. Uh, almost all of the problems we're going to see, you're starting with one unit and you want to get to the other unit. So you have to cancel the starting unit. So in this problem, one atmosphere is 760 millimeters. We could have written 760 on top and one atmosphere on the bottom. But you want the starting unit to cancel out. Millimeters of mercury over millimeters of mercury is like x over x. It goes to 1. So in your calculator, if you go 452 divided by 760, you'll get the answer. And remember that this is an exact number, so we don't have to worry about significant figures with this one. This is a 3 sig fig number. So when you put 452 divided by 760, you ideally want to get a 3 sig fig number, 0.595 atmospheres. And you could write that as 5.95 times 10 to the minus 1. Any questions on that? So length is a type of unit. Temperature, of course, hot, cold is a type of unit. This is just another player, all right? And we haven't had to deal with it because we haven't dealt with gases. But when it comes to gases, it's pretty important. High pressure will squish your sample down, and low pressure will let it expand a lot more. So that's why pressure is important when it comes to gases. OK, pressure changes depending on your elevation. All right, pressure is basically, like I said, the result of gas molecules. And as the gas molecules are pushed down more, you have more pressure. So this is, uh, earlier I said how roughly at sea level, they expect you to have an atmosphere of about one atmosphere, give or take. As you start going up in elevation, though, your pressure goes down. So for example, Denver, the mile high city, 5,200 feet or so, 0.83 atmospheres is their normal uh, pressure. Um, this place in Bolivia, much less, much higher even than Denver, 0.62 atmospheres. And on the very top of Mount Everest, uh, which is pretty high, of course, 0.35 atmospheres. If you watch movies of people climbing Everest, they usually use supplemental oxygen and stuff to get through. Crazy. Um, this is relevant to us, though, too, because here at Gresham, the city, the elevation at City Hall is supposedly 301 feet. <laughs> right, that's something I looked up. Um, so that's higher than sea level, right? We're 301 feet above sea level. And as you start to go up in elevation, then your pressure starts to go down. So usually in Gresham, we're less than one atmosphere. And um, there is a, a barometer, like I said right here, there's even electronic ones in our lab, so you can monitor the pressure. And most days, our pressure is less than one atmosphere. Once in a while, it's higher. Like storms come in, they start to bring all kinds of pressure craziness. But more often than not, Gresham, Troutdale, our area is going to be less than one atmosphere. So going back in history, all right, this first player we're going to look at, his name is Robert Boyle. And I love their wigs, man. They're so wild. But anyway, look at the date, 1600s, all right, time of Torricelli, some kind of nobility, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he was actually studying these gases. And I mean, 1600s, I mean, they didn't even have, like, electricity, I, you know, maybe some kind of indoor plumbing, but that's about it, right? And so my hat's off to Boyle and all of these people. But anyway, Boyle was measuring the pressure and the volume of gases. And he realized that whatever pressure he was at, the volume would compensate so that pressure times volume was always equal to a constant K, all right? Now, we're gonna talk in a little bit about what's called the ideal gas law, which is part of Boyle's law. And so uh, when we get there, this will make more sense, but just realize that pressure and volume always equal to a constant. Now, imagine my one hand is pressure and the other one is volume. And if I multiply these together, it's always equal to some constant. 
What Boyle's Law means is, let's say pressure goes up, that means your volume is going to go down, because these two multiplied together have to equal some kind of constant. On the other hand, your pressure goes way down, then your volume's going to go way up, because again, those two multiplied have to equal a constant. And this is why I was saying earlier that as the pressure gets greater, it's like squishes the molecules closer together, so their volume is smaller. On the other hand, if the pressure lets up for whatever reason, then the gases will expand and they'll have a larger volume. Now, in science, all right, this means this is an inverse relationship because as one goes up, the other one goes down, all right? Or as the other one goes up, then the first one goes down. Another thing that's really helpful, though, and this is what Boyle's Law is usually written as, is because the pressure times the volume equals a constant, you can have two sets of conditions. P1 and V1 would be like the initial set, and P2 and V2 should be the final set. And because both of these have to equal some random constant, you can set them equal to each other. And this is a pretty handy equation. If you start with a gas at a certain pressure and volume, and you change, we'll say, the pressure, all right, P2, you can then calculate what the new volume V2 is going to be. I'll show you examples of what this means here. Any questions? Pressure and volume are inversely related. Weight on the plunger of a sealed syringe increases the pressure on the air in the syringe. The air cannot escape, but its volume reduces under the pressure. This is a way to show, not too difficult, that this equation actually works. Um, this is a, a way to mimic pressure, and they're essentially adding a metal, and it's squishing the uh, little stopper down, all right? So inside here, there's a volume of gas, and initially they have so much mass of lead, then they have 500 grams, 1,000, so this is like increasing the pressure. And as you increase the lead, it pushes the syringe down, so the volume gets a lot smaller. So if the volume was initially 8 milliliters, then it goes down and down. Now people tried at first to measure volume versus pressure directly. And when you do that, you get kind of this weird curve thing. And scientists, as we're going to see, love to have straight lines. All right, straight lines are pretty easy to predict. So instead of volume versus pressure directly, they took volume versus one over pressure. You could also do the same thing with pressure versus one over volume, either way. But you do get a nice straight line. And straight lines are cool in science because if you remember from math, all right, the equation for a straight line is uh, y equals some kind of slope times x plus the y-intercept, y equals ax plus b, or mx plus b, something like that. And you can find the slope at the y-intercept from this kind of graph. Why is that helpful, Ms. Dr. Russell? Great question. Well, maybe your gas uh, has this kind of pressure. You can then calculate what the new volume should be, and then you can correspond it with an actual experiment to verify. And Boyle's Law is really easy to figure out. It's really nice that how accurate it is, actually. Um, so knowing an equation will help you to find it. Like that. Cool. So pressure goes up, volume goes down. Volume goes up, pressure goes down. They're inversely related to each other. Questions? Good. All right. Charles. Jack Charles, another person stuff that's uh, quite a ways uh, away from us in time. Uh, he was in France, I believe. But anyway, Charles was a balloonist, all right? At the time, making a balloon that goes flying over is a big thing. And uh, it's pretty interesting. He made a balloon like this and, you know, waved goodbye to all his friends. He went over to the next town. They thought he was like an alien. They were throwing sticks at him and stuff like that. They didn't know what it was. So the, the thing now when you're in a balloon is if you come down on someone else's property, you hand them a bottle of champagne because, you know, you're supposed to, and they do that even now. Uh, it was because of things like this that they wanted to get the word out. But anyway, I digress. So Charles, of course, was interested in gases because that's what his uh, balloon was all about. He measured volume and temperature of the gas, all right? It was basically measuring temperature changes and how volume goes.
was around. And what he found is that the volume and the temperature of a gas are directly related. So as the temperature went up, the volume went up. As the temperature went down, the volume went down. So this in science and math would be a direct relationship, all right? So back to pressure and volume, pressure goes up, volume goes down, they're inverse. However, in this case, volume and temperature, if the temperature goes up, your volume goes up. Temperature goes down, your volume goes down. And you can write that, if you want, as volume equals some kind of constant times the temperature. That's the way to see this direct relationship. Um, but likewise, all right, you can rewrite this with two sets of conditions. Like if you divide both sides here by T, you get V over T equals K. So one set of conditions will equal the other set of conditions, or V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. This is the math way to talk about Charles' law and how volume and temperature uh, works out. Any questions? Now, knowing that volume and temperature are proportional like this, okay? What do you think would happen to this equation mathematically if you get down to the freezing point of water? It's Celsius. What is the freezing point of water in Celsius? Zero, Zero right on. Can you have, in this non-science fiction world anyway, can you have a zero volume gas? No, right on. But gas always is gonna, it has mass. Mass always has a density, which means it has volume. It's gonna be a positive volume, all right? If your temperature of the gas in Celsius went negative, so you went under zero Celsius, then you end up with a negative volume, which is again, kind of cool science fiction, but not very helpful. So one thing that's not just optional, it's critical and required, is you must use Kelvin temperatures for T here, all right? If you start dividing by zero or getting negative numbers, it's gonna mess up all of your calculations big time. So Kelvin must be used for temperature. Now in the actual lab, we'll usually make recordings in Celsius, all right? It's a convenient thing to use. And when you're doing though the math, you've got to convert your Celsius into Kelvin to make it work, or else you'll start getting all kinds of weird things. Is that cool? Temperature and volume are directly related. As heat is added to a sealed syringe, the volume of the air in the syringe increases. A plot of gas temperature and volume demonstrates that the relationship between them is linear. If we extrapolate the line down to a temperature of absolute zero, in principle, the gas has no volume. Okay, this is an example of how to make Charles' law work for us. Um, this is just, again, a syringe. There's a little bit of gas volume inside there, and there's a certain temperature that the water was at. So they have a temperature and a volume, and then they start heating it up. So the temperature starts going up, and you can see the syringe itself starts expanding out as well. Temperature goes up, volume goes up. And of course, if you cooled it down, it would be the opposite. Temperature goes down, volume goes down. So that's Charles' law, and it works really, really well. Now, there is a problem, though, if you go all the way down to absolute zero. Absolute zero in science is a pretty uh, important concept because matter is almost always like vibrating a little bit, like shaking. At zero Kelvin, all of that movement stops, all right? You no longer have the energy even for these small little movements. The problem with absolute zero is that as you go to zero, you can see here how all these volumes go to zero as well. And a zero volume gas doesn't make a lot of sense for what we know about mass. Uh, mass is gonna have grams. Grams has a density, which means it has a volume. And if it has a mass, it's not gonna be a zero volume gas. It'll be small numbers possibly, but it won't be zero. So we're gonna talk about later what scientists do with this zero Kelvin, all right? Um, and there's some kind of weird things that happen down there. So I'm kind of previewing one of the things we're going to get into. 
Now, besides using syringes and heating them in water and stuff like that, you can also use things like liquid nitrogen. And this is an example of an experiment that's done sometimes. These are balloons, all right? They do this at OMSI a lot. And this substance right here is liquid nitrogen. It's a very, very cold substance, much colder than dry ice. It's 77 Kelvin, something like that, minus 196. Anyway, they put these balloons in the liquid nitrogen. So they took the temperature way down for the balloons, all right? And as the balloon temperature went down, the volume went down too. It shrinks way down. You can see this one has just been pulled out of the liquid nitrogen bath. However, you let these cold balloons sit for a while, they expand right back. It's pretty cool. It's pretty neat because the gas temperature goes up, so the volume goes up again, and they go back to the same volume they had before, which is pretty cool. So, any questions? Okay, so this is an example of a type of problem you would do with Charles Law, all right? And assuming, we'll talk about why this is important, assuming the pressure and the amounts are constant, we have a gas, here's the volume at this temperature, and it says at what temperature would the same gas have a volume of 310 milliliters, all right? So we're trying to find now the temperature. And Charles' law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So in this problem, this would be like V1, our initial volume, and 25 Celsius would be T1. But do we want to use Celsius when it comes to gases? No, I see several of you shaking your heads. Good. Yeah, people are listening. Yeah, you want to make sure you turn all of your gas temperatures into Kelvin before throwing them in here. So we'll talk about that a little bit too. The volume V2, all right, would be 310 milliliters. So the question is, what's the new temperature? So before we get too crazy, we need to get T2 out of the denominator. And so in math, we can do that by multiplying both sides by T2. So T2 over T2 is just one. And then we need to get T2 by itself to make sense of this. So I'm gonna multiply both sides now by T1 over V1, basically the opposite of what we have here. So on this side then, I'll have times T1 over V1. The T1s cancel on the left and the V1s cancel. So we're left with T2 equals V2, T1 over V1. Any questions on that? Okay, so at this point, you can put the volume in milliliters in as is. You can also convert to liters first, which is cool, but you're welcome to use milliliters. The temperature, though, we need to turn into Kelvin, and the answer we get, T2, is going to come out in Kelvin. So these answers here are all in Celsius, so we're going to take our answer in T2 and in Kelvin and go back to Celsius. So in this problem, all right, first you've got to figure out the equation, and this isn't too bad. You've got to turn Celsius into Kelvin, put it in here, plug and chug, and you're going to get a T2 in Kelvin, and then you're going to convert it back into Celsius. So the first question, what number do scientists use to go between Celsius and Kelvin? 273.15, the best answer possible, well done. 273.15, that's right. Kelvin temperatures can never be negative, but Celsius temperatures can. So the Celsius temperature plus 273.15 will give you the Kelvin temperature. And Kelvin minus 273.15 would give you Celsius. Second thing, there's a little dot there by 310. What does this dot mean when it comes to this measurement? It means the zero significant. Excellent. Well done. Zeros and sig figs are a little weird. And sometimes this is a meaningful number, sometimes it's not. So absolutely, if you see the little dot, it just means then that this is a three sig fig number, that zero is significant. Well done. Questions on any of that stuff?
All right. So then let's start plugging and checking. All right. So we said here how the V2, the new volume, is 310 milliliters. That goes on the top. Kelvin, 25 degrees Celsius plus 273.15, cut it off at the ones, 298 Kelvin. You divide it by the initial volume, 235. So the answer comes out to be 393, but that's Kelvin, all right? It's not Celsius yet, it's Kelvin. So to get from Kelvin back to Celsius, then you subtract 273, 120 degrees Celsius. Any questions? Um, another player in all of this gas stuff is Avogadro. Now Avogadro is good old Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And his idea for Avogadro's number came out of, this, of the study of gases as well, which is just crazy. And basically what Avogadro thought is he had two balloons, all right? And this balloon was twice as big as this balloon right here, all right? Well, he said that, aha, if the volume is twice as big, that must mean we have twice as many molecules. And if you had three times as many molecules, you would have a volume that was three times as big as the original balloon. So what Avogadro was saying is that the amount N, which we're going to use moles, by the way, the amount N is proportional to volume. All right, so you increase the moles, the amount, you increase the volume. They both go up at the same time. On the other hand, if you decrease the amount, moles of gas, then you would decrease the volume. So the volume and the moles amount are proportional to each other. And like we saw on the volume temperature part earlier, you can rearrange this a little bit, put the N on the other side and the bottom, and you get V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. So this is like saying the amount, this amount has this volume, and this new amount N has this volume right there. <clears throat> now remember in this world, we're in the moles N, right? As in time. Uh, we haven't thought about moles for a while, but if you remember on the periodic table, all of the red numbers up there tell you the grams per mole of your sample. So for example, oxygen, 15.9994, that's about 16, 16 grams of oxygen in a mole of oxygen. So if you had eight grams of oxygen, you could divide by 16 to have half of a mole. That's kind of what you do to find these mole amounts. It's stuff we've done before, just we haven't done it as much this term so far, so. Questions. <clears throat> Quantity and volume are directly related. If we take eight molecules of H2 and combine them with four molecules of O2, we get 12 molecules and a combined volume. If we then react the mixture, we end up with eight molecules of gaseous H2O, which occupies the same volume as eight molecules of any other gas. So this is kind of a cool video. Um, we're making water, all right? Hydrogen and oxygen are both diatomic, so that's why they're listed as, H, as H2 and O2. And to make water H2O, then the balanced reaction, 2H2 plus O2 making two waters. Now, why this is important is because notice there's a two there, a two there, but like a one right there. So initially, all right, if we had eight molecules of H2, then the eight molecules would take up a volume the size of the circle, which is twice as big as the amount of oxygen, because there's like two moles of H2 for every one mole of O2. Now in molecules, which are proportional to moles, eight molecules of gas would take up twice the volume as four molecules of gas. This is what Avogadro's thing is all about. Um, in the video, initially they showed a bigger circle, which showed the 8 plus 4, 12 molecules total before the water was made. So the more molecules, the more moles, the bigger the volume. However, once the reaction occurred, you end up making 2 moles of water for every 2 moles of hydrogen, or 8 molecules of hydrogen would make 8 molecules of water. Excuse me, and the volume of the product is the same as the volume of the H2 that we started with. 
Um, it's pretty cool. Um, these are all different gases, but the amounts of gas, the number of molecules are the same. And notice how the volume of these balloons is the same too. That's the idea. Um, this works for pressure as well. Instead of volume, you can think about pressure and quantity too. And pressure and moles will also be the same. Any questions on this? Okay. Uh, this is going to be a good place to take a break. We'll look at the ideal gas law here in a little bit, which is a new section. Um, it's about 9.51, 9.56-ish or so. Come back here and we'll take on the ideal gas law.